comments, questions, uh, sharing experiences. Let's take first three. Please uh, present yourself, your name, where you come from, and if you have a question to whom you are addressing the question. And we'll take here the gentleman with the red shirt, then here in front, and there a gentleman with the glasses. Um, well, we've covered a lot of interesting issues, and uh, my name is Ahti Tolvan, and uh, I'm retired. I used to work at the University of Helsinki, and before that, at, uh, Concordia uh, in Montreal. Uh, a lot of work, uh, among other things, uh, has to do with immigration. And uh, unlike what the, uh, the chairman advises, we've listened to three speakers and then we're supposed to ask them questions individually. I'll depart from that, ask questions of all three of the speakers and they can uh, in unison and respond to them, which is what we're doing now. So first of all, to the speaker from uh, Sweden, um, I'd like to ask this curious uh, um, uh, feature that you mentioned about asylum seekers, that 50% of them live with friends and rel relatives. Uh, in Finland, uh, we have uh, some church activists who are trying to do this, and uh, uh, very few asylum seekers live with, uh, in the community. Most of them live in the, in the uh, reception center. Is there some kind of a social program, for instance, do uh, people who house uh, asylum seekers get uh, uh, some kind of a subsidy from the state? Uh, they, they spend the same money on refugees who go to uh, people's homes as uh, people who are in uh, asylum centers. Uh, I didn't quite understand what you said about resettled uh, have lower employment. That you did say that resettled have lower employment uh, than asylum seekers, uh, but did you say that um, what did, what did you really mean about refugees do better after intermarrying? Um, do you mean that the, this indicates that refugees are perhaps not as active in seeking uh, opportunities on the marriage market um, as, as uh, other uh, employment-related immigrants? Um, um, or is it generally that job seekers who come here in, in, in search of employment uh, are used to traveling around from country to country and may not be uh, caught by the census taker? Um, the uh, refugee minors issue that Mr. Muttikan mentioned in Finland, uh, where he's, he mentioned that that we have a fairly successful uh, program for receiving refugee minors. Well, recently the policy was announced that uh, Although the number of refusals is, is, is going to go up as the selection criteria uh, are tightened, uh, uh, I think you said from about 30% to 20% to 10% only will be received. It's been announced that, however, children will be taken. In other words, we have a situation where the parents will be asked to leave the country and uh, the children will be taken into the protection of these programs. How humane a policy is that and what do you think the results will be on the education of the children. And I'm just curious, as a short question to uh, Professor Nandi from Essex. You mentioned that uh, people have a, um, a stronger uh, or weaker sense of ethnic identity because they live in London. Uh, what is the explanation for that? My name is Thomas Sama. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki in the Faculty of Social Sciences. And my research interest includes the labor market and integration issues. Now I want to address my question to uh, Alita Nandi. But before my question, I'm going to make a comment. Now, if we look at integration refugees issues in the UK from outside in, the, the UK and France, from outside in, unlike in uh, Finland and uh, Sweden, the UK is known as a great colonial power. So we have to trace this to the time of colonialism. Um, the UK and France colonized, I'd say, more than 10% of the world. And today we have the Commonwealth. I'm originally from Cameroon. We have the Commonwealth made up of 52 countries, and we also have the Francophonie. And 
through the common world and the colonial, uh, you know, the colonialism by the UK, the UK exercises a lot of political, economic, and social power on so many countries, especially the common uh, wealth countries. Uh, I'll tell you from uh, outside in that many of the leaders in the Commonwealth country, countries from Cameroon, Ghana, Nigeria, all the countries that were colonized by the UK were all trained in the UK and their children and families have formed an elitist family there in the UK up till today. So colonialism, uh, you know, the issue, issue of refugees and so on in the UK dates back really, really a long time ago. My question is, and it is something which the UK cannot escape from it. I've been following up how the UK is struggling with, this, with these issues. Issues of Commonwealth, people from Commonwealth countries migrating there. So my question is, how does the UK deal with the, uh, uh, the integration of the various ethnic groups of people from all over the, com uh, all over, uh, you know, all over the Commonwealth countries? So how do they deal with these people uh, there in the UK, in terms of um, promoting equal opportunities, equality, social in, uh, inclusion, to ensure that the gap in terms of inequality and segregation doesn't grow that much between the ethnic groups and that some ethnic minority groups are not left out. Thank you. Uh, my name is Miguel Nino. I am a research fellow here at Wider. <clears throat> so um, I have, if I may, just a, a few questions, just br brief questions. Uh, the first one is to Nahikari. I found the, the paper very interesting. So I just have a few questions for clarification. So you make a distinction between uh, asylum seekers and refugee resettled individuals. Um, and you saw difference in their choices about where to live. But is it not that as asylum seekers then become later on resettled uh, refugees. It's just the differences between in the time be before asylum seekers become refugees. So I was not sure whether you, this is the same problem, but there's just like a time varying problem there, no? This is the first question. So I don't know too much about this pro uh, issue, but my second question is that I don't see the, the marriage market or as you call the inter, uh, intermarriage uh, sector as, uh, as, as an, a strong uh, explanatory factor that may lead to better outcome for the migrants because I see it as an intermediate actually outcome because I can imagine that you know more not only better educated people but maybe more sociable individuals, more uh, entrepreneurial uh, individuals are more likely to engage with the locals and therefore they ended up with Better alcohol, but it's not to marry a sweet or no. Uh, so, um, and therefore, you have, I think, an endogenity, uh, endogenity problem. I'm talking about the economics here. <laughs> but if you take away Stockholm, for example, does your results hold? So, that's my first, que my other question. No? So, if you take away Stockholm, where I'm sure many of the migrants or those who have a specific uh, characteristics go, if you take away Stockholm from the sample, I'm sure the results may be different. And the, the other question about um, I have uh, for Thomas is, what are the main reasons uh, for rejection of the applicants? Because the percentage that you show, there's a large percentage of rejections. So which are the main reasons that the Finnish government have decided to reject those applications? Yes. Uh, so thank you. So one question was why do ethnic minorities in living in London have weaker ethnic identity or why I think they do? Uh, it goes back to this idea that um, if you are living in an area where you're surrounded by people who belong to the same ethnic group as you, you don't register because there has to be another ethnic group. There has to be a difference for you to be aware of your ethnic group. So when you live in this situation uh, in, in London, Ethnic minorities are not aware, as much aware of their ethnic group because everybody is an ethnic minority. Ethnicity itself is less of an issue. But if you're an ethnic minority in the rest of the England, that's what I'm studying here, uh, you are always aware. You're the five people living in a village. I mean, your, your family is the only uh, Indian family or black family or Caribbean family. And so in those interactions, you're always aware of it. And 
And the thing is that it's not that uh, ethnic identity for ethnic minorities living in London is very low. It's just relatively lower. Again, the idea is that, I mean, this is where it's not an individual action. It is a societal action. If you're constantly made to feel that you're the other, you will be aware of the, that you're the other. And so that depends on what actions everybody together does. Because there is no reason why particular groups are salient in one country, but they make no, there is no difference in another country. That's what I'm saying, that these groups are differences. We create them in a sense. And so that is that question perhaps answers. Your question, I cannot say what the government is doing as such, but uh, in the 1960s and 70s where there were a lot of riots and issues were highlighted about uh, the discrimination, open discrimination that used to go on in terms of housing, uh, employment, the Race Relations Act, Act, the first one, was introduced, I think, 1973. Since then, it has been upgraded, and ethnicity, religion, uh, your accent, dress, appearance, all these have become protected categories, so you can't be discriminated on those bases. Having said that, if you look at the actual numbers, so proportion employed, uh, proportion living in poverty in the different ethnic groups, there is a huge difference. So ethnic minorities are more likely to be poor, more likely to be without job, have a lower income. But in UK particularly, it's Pakistani and Bangladeshis who have a very high poverty rates. So I agree to all the other things that you said. There's nothing uh, to say about that. Uh, just the point is there are some policies in effect, but there is still discrimination and harassment that goes on for another different um, project. I am looking at the effect of ethnic and racial harassment and its effect on mental health and well-being, and it is, it exists. I mean, the initial results show that not only there is a high proportion of ethnic minori minorities saying that they have experienced physical or verbal abuse in the last one year, but as a result, their well-being and mental health is lower after controlling for all the other factors that could affect. So it is a reality, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Alita, and then Tuomas. Well, uh, thank you. Um, there were two questions for me, the first one by Ahti Tolvan, and so uh, there has been some debate uh, in Finnish public that um, there might even be cases where, uh, where the parents of a family of asylum seekers would not be allowed to stay, but the, a, a child would stay. Okay, so I I, I don't have any uh, knowledge about you know uh, to what extent this is actually the case because sometimes the stories twist a little bit when they are mediatized, and uh, uh, but the big question is really and. Because there are, so there's a fair number of unaccompanied minors uh, in here that, uh, well, it, it doesn't look good in many respects for the, for the children uh, who will remain here. I mean, in terms of family context. So I cannot be any more specific in my reply to that because I don't know. Uh, uh, was it Mi Miguel? Uh, the, uh, the, the second uh, question... So, uh, what are the reasons of rejection for for the reasons of rejection in the rise of, uh, in well, the, well, anyway, yeah. So, why there are more rejections today? <clears throat> well, uh, well uh, there are two key features, as far as I have understood correctly. It would be actually somebody better from the Finnish Immigration Service because they deal on a daily to day-to-day -day basis on this. But the first uh, major reason seems to be that uh, many of the people who arrived last year were not to say the same type of, of uh, asylum seekers that had arrived in the previous years, meaning that you know, their, their profile was somewhat, somewhat different. And in this case, they didn't fulfill the, the, the existing criteria. Um, one, uh, Big, another big reason is, but I cannot say how large uh, part of the explanation this is, that this what is uh, in popular terms called a secondary protection, that you know you don't actually fulfill all the criteria, but you know we cannot send you back. 
so this has been taken away. Uh, and that, that, is, that is the big question. That, uh, that is also probably, uh, if I have understood correctly, the main reason why probably the, the paperless, the undocumented section will grow. So, and, and that's a very clear uh, uh, political message in a way that, that who is invited to stay. Thank you very much. Tuomas and then Nahikari. I'll start uh, with the first um, set of questions. Um, I'm not sure if relatives or family members of uh, refugees get any funding if they house um, refugees. I know that the family reunification of uh, refugee family members is supported by the Swedish government. But beyond that, I've never heard that they receive any funding, which doesn't mean that they don't, but I haven't heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, about the second question, differences in employment between resettled refugees and asylum seekers, is that what you asked me? Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, the, uh, studies find that asylum, uh, resettled refugees uh, they have lower employment rates than asylum seekers. And they explain this by... Uh, you mean, uh, yes, sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, is... and they, they explain this mostly um, by differences in placement policies. That's the main explanation. And then in relation to that, um, faster acculturation, etc., networks. Mm -hmm that asylum seekers would have in comparison to quota refugees. About the, the role of intermarriage in refugees labor markets um, integration, uh, according to our study, um, in general, intermarriage increases immigrants' um, labor market outcomes, but for refugees, we only found this on employment rates, but not on salary increase. That's, that was our finding. So the second set of questions, um, are asylum seekers later on uh, resettled? No, I am, I, when, I, when I talk about resettled refugees, I'm, I'm uh, referring to quota refugees, actually. So that's, I wanted to make that distinction because uh, because, uh, as I said, there are policy differences that may later affect their labor market participation. Mm -hmm. About um, the intermarriage premium, we did control for uh, the most common human capital and socio-demographic variables, but I do agree that there are certain characteristics like uh, personality traits, perseverance, even physical appearance that can actually make all these people more attractive. Uh, when they are seeking a job and also when they are meeting um, people socially. Um, and I didn't quite understand your question about if I remove Stockholm from our study on intermarriage. You have an optimal sorting problem, no? Mm -hmm. Those <coughs> individuals which you cannot control for the observables mm -hmm. are more likely to go to Stockholm. So if you remove Stockholm, and Yes, perhaps, perhaps that will be the case. Thank you for suggesting that. Thanks. Thank you very much for the first set of questions. Next ones. Please hear in, in the gentleman in front. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. My name is Jeff Crisp. Uh, I used to be Head of Policy at UNHCR, uh, now at Chatham House in London. I just had a question about citizenship and the extent to which citizenship plays a fundamental role in the integration process. And I don't think here's the time to talk about what integration is, but let's assume that we know what we're talking about. But does speedy access to citizenship actually make people feel more part of the society that they've joined rather than part of an ethnic minority group. I know in Canada, for example, it's always been a policy to offer very rapid access to citizenship for precisely that reason. And I just wonder whether there's any evidence from the three countries that you represent on the podium about the impact of citizenship on integration. Thank you. Um, so I'm Rachel Gizelquist. I'm with you and you wider. And I wanted to pick up on a point that, uh, that came out at the end of uh, Thomas's presentation and also Alita's presentation about uh, the policies and programs to support integration and to 
uh, reduce inequalities. Um, I, I was very struck by Alita's presentation and the discussion of uh, thinking about social identity and personal identity and how that's a useful way of, of sort of stepping into thinking about what sort of policies might work. Um, and you went over the slide quickly, but I think I got this right. You make a point about um, policies and programs that force uh, people to think of themselves as individuals rather than group members as being particularly promising in supporting integration. Uh, so I guess first question, is that right, <laughs> that, I, that I understood your point correctly? And then secondly, for the other panelists, what do you think about that? Um, do, you, do you find that that's, uh, do you find support for that also in your work? Um, and then for the panelists as well as for the, the room, because I know many of you here work on, on these issues and know much more about these topics than I do, um, what are some examples then of, of policies and programs in this vein that have, have worked or, or simply have not worked? So. My name is Jonathan Hall. I'm an assistant professor at Uppsala University, and I teach a bit on social psychology, and so my comment is directed to Anita. Um, so just following up with a previous comment. So my question is, I'm tempted well, my comment would be, I'm tempted to, to, you know, throw out the so what question, you know, oh, so what, you know, uh, you know, social contact uh, results in a reduction of, you know, the salience of ethnic identity, hmm. you know, but at the same time, I wonder if, first of all, it would be nice to know what is your measure for, because you talk about it reduces identity, do you mean this, you know, the, the degree to which one rates on a scale the importance of a particular social category, is that what you're looking at? Um, yes. Okay. And then, um, apart from that, then I'm thinking, well, you could make this more interesting by trying to attach it to maybe a bit more of the findings in the literature. I mean, you talked about decategorization, right? So you seem to be interested in prejudice, um, you're mentioning, for example, the research on Alpor and so on. So, the, so my first stepping back and back and back, I'm thinking, is this about prejudice? Is this about integration? These are kind of two different things, related but different. Um, if you're interested in prejudice, then my next question would be, do you have measures of prejudice in the survey? No? No. Okay, so then your focus is then on, it, it seems that, that it's actually on kind of integration, in, in a way, seems to be your focus. Yes, in a, I mean, uh, okay, go ahead, you finish. Then that. you could go to the acculturation literature yeah. and look at not just the salience of identity, but see if you can create constructs of acculturation from the data, which might be quite possible, given that if you have like a categorical variable of social identity, like ethnic identity, and then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, so we did that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it depends on how you're going to define. So we used Barry's framework of minority majority identity and whether people identify strongly with both their, so obviously there's a way of you could measure it different ways. The way we had measured is we had question on whether they identify strongly with their parents' ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And we also had questions on Britishness mm -hmm. on a scale of one to 10. So what we said was if they said, both were on the same scale, one to 10. And if their report was greater than median, the median value, we call that the strong identification. And we did find ethnic minorities were more likely to report uh, being, of what I have a table over there, of integrated identity. So they would, about 47% reported having strong identity, both Britishness and their parents' ethnic group. And so uh, that brings me back to this issue of integration because mm -hmm. I'm always amazed at this issue of ethnic minorities having to integrate, except I don't know what they're going to integrate to because when we looked at it, uh, for the white majority, we did a similar exercise where we compared their Britishness with their national, I mean, country identity. So Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish, uh, English. They're all residents, the so white majority in all these countries were, I think about 50% were more likely to have a separated identity. So they were more likely to say very strong Scottish, Welsh, English identity rather than a British identity. So if the majority is not British, then what is the issue of integration? So anyway, that is one of your questions. And that's a very interesting 
point though. Uh, it's fascinating. Now I'm I'm wondering a bit about the the still the kind of what it, uh, like so what kind of question. I'm wondering how you can make it more interesting to me. That's that's one point. Maybe digging into the acculturation literature, attaching to it a bit more closely would be one avenue. The other avenue would be focusing on. You, you mentioned later uh, later like what are the implications of of your analysis, right? Is it that for example, uh, decategorization is uh, an important. Uh, strategy to approach, for example, to, in, to for integration. But um, I don't know if you can really say that from your research, um, but you might be able to look at other strategies like decategorization, recategorization, uh, social identity complexity. These are some things that you might be able to get at, at least measure in terms of outcomes, right? You could do that. And then you don't have a prejudice to look at. Uh, so you can't look at those processes and their impact on prejudice, but you could look at the determinants of for uh, di those different processes that you could do, and that could be interesting. But I would be very cautious to draw conclusions from this research that decategorization would be a good uh, a uh, approach for integration, because you could just be measuring, um, for example, social identity complexity by, if you're just looking at decategor or, um, redu reduction in the salience of one particular category, that could be combined with other categories and could be part of a complex structure of social identity. So it's not decategorization, it's, uh, it's multiple social categorization at work. Um, so I would just caution against making a, that kind of uh, jump to policy in particular, and also perhaps going and seeing what your data can do for you in terms of capturing uh, those different processes. So decategorization, recategorization into a common in group, social identity complexity, those are at least three strategies you could look at. So just, so we do have, so this was a part of a module of questions on measuring different domains of identity. Mm -hmm. So the ethnic and racial background was one of them. There were others like your political beliefs, gender, family, uh, now I can't remember the national identity, so on. And we did look at it. Most of the identities actually do move together. But what was interesting, and that is the paper that we are now working on, is how ethnic and political identity did not move together for ethnic minorities, but did move together for majority groups. So what we are trying to look at is what political identity does and how that interacts with ethnic identity. Okay. So I agree that we have to look at it, but just to be sure, we have control for a lot of social demographic characteristics, which do also contribute to identity. So that is controlled for in the models. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you, thank you very much. Um, Alita, there were also the two Sorry. other questions that were addressed to all three of you. Do you want to say something? And then I'll give floor to Tuomas and, okay. and Nahikari. Yeah, they're short because we have not looked at citizenship. We have a question, yeah, you said citizenship. So we have, a question, we have questions on citizenship, but for this model we had not looked at. And that is a good point, we can look at it. Um, and the other question, was the general uh, Rachel's question on policies. And I do agree that um, this is a jump, um, like you said, um, to policies. But the idea is that um, small scale surveys and experiments have looked at all the different links. What we were trying to just establish is how does it fare? Because a lot of these social psychology and these kind of issues are not included in large scale surveys. And so you're not never sure whether those were the result of these 50 people that you were looked at, uh, you studied, or will these relationships hold in a large survey? The problem with that always happens is when it's a large survey, then the sophistication of the measure goes down because you can at most ask one or two questions about that issue. There are a lot of other questions being asked. And so there is this balance. And the purpose was not to look at all of it, it was to look at just this one relationship between type of contact and ethnic identity, just because we could do that with a large scale survey and to see whether those um, findings that people have found with experiments would also hold up for a large scale survey to provide some robustness to those findings. Yes. And actual policies, um, I don't know, I'm, I, I don't deal with policies directly, but um, I have heard of uh, many um, London religious groups which have tended to not, um, so local councils, 
they have started giving money not for one particular religious group to have some activity, but to have interfaith activities. And the idea is it brings all religious groups together and they interact with each other. And I'm sort of, again, this is quite anecdotal, not based on my research, but when they were interviewed, the people who attended, they said, oh, I have a lot of things in common with this other person I was talking to. So I think some effort is being done, but I'm doing hand-waving at this point. Thank you very much. And then, uh, Thomas, your reflections on the two questions asked. Yeah, I, I, I'm so sorry, both Jeff and Rachel, but because uh, you were asking, I think, quite simply, you know, what works or do certain things work? Uh, and I have been now here thinking for five minutes, can I think of any uh, empirical study in Finland that would have actually been focusing on these type of issues? And I have to say that I just haven't come up here. I hope I'm not doing injustice to anyone who has done her or his whole life work on this. But uh, so uh, I can't say. And what about Mahikar? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for Rachel either. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, as for the relationship between citizenship and integration, I haven't done research on that myself, but I've uh, reviewed the literature on labor market integration for teaching purposes. And um, I must say that there is no consensus of the relationship between, on the effect of citizenship on labor market outcomes for immigrants. But there is also, there are very big differences in, first of all, who decides to naturalize. For example, in Sweden, EU people tend not to naturalize as much as non-EU people for obvious uh, reasons. But there seems to be a um, 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 citizenship premium for everybody, but especially for non-EU migrants. And, um, but again, there is, um, it is difficult to say that it is actually citizenship premium because there could be that those people have invested um, uh, resources in getting education or or in, um, again, um, trying to get better jobs uh, because they, they are um, thinking of staying in the country and then they decide to naturalize also as part of the same um, idea. But I think in general, um, uh, research shows that uh, citizen immigrants do better in the labor market. Thank you very much. I think that we are coming to the end of our session. I would like to thank Nahikari, Tuomas and Alita for interesting presentations, bringing in the forefront some of the aspects related to refugees and integration. I think that like uh, it, it shows from your presentations, also from, from the questions that we are talking of uh, a phenomenon, a process which is very much in progress and our responses still are in a learning curve. And for sure this is a topic that will con continue to be in the forefront, not only in the Finnish newspapers, as Thomas was saying, but also in the forefront of future research. I thank you also for the participants for staying with us for the whole two hours and also for the interesting questions, definitely challenging also the, the, the speakers, I think, in a, in, a, in a very nice way and also broadening a little bit our own thinking that, yes, where do we, how do we take this information? What are we going to do with it? What kinds of policy responses should we think about? So thank you very much for the, for, for the participants. Mm -hmm.